Hello. Welcome to this lecture about pediatric gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's worth mentioning that the slides of this lecture are the courtesy of the Mass Vegan Foundation and used for teaching purposes. Before starting, let's familiarize ourselves with few terms. First of all, gastroesophageal reflux, which means passage of gastric contents into the esophagus, while gastroesophageal reflux disease is when the reflux contents cause symptoms or complications. Regurgitation means passage of reflux gastric contents into the oropharynx while vomiting is the expulsion of reflux contents from the mouth. This slide showing you the anti-reflux mechanisms in our body. So you can appreciate the presence of the diaphragm crura separating the intrathoracic area from the intra-abdominal area with the different pressures. You can also appreciate the angle of tess, which is the angle the esophagus is entering the fundus of the stomach. And the most important part, which is the lower esophageal sphincter. This is more of functional area of muscular layer that separates the gastric contents from reaching into the esophagus. And actually, it is not an anatomical sphincter to start with. In this slide, you can see the first of all the anatomy of the uh, upper esophageal sphincter, the lower esophageal sphincter area, and the stomach. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see that there is a couple of measures showing. First of all, the pH in the lower esophageal area, then um, the pressure waves in the pharynx, the esophageal body, the lower esophageal area, and the stomach. I hope you can appreciate that the rising in those waves showing the contraction, while going down on those waves means dropping of the pressure or relaxation. In the middle of the slide, you can see one column crossing all your measures, which shows that when the lower surgical sphincter relaxed, you can see that the red line representing the pH in the lower esophagus is dropping, which means that when the lower surgical sphincter relaxed, the gastric contents reflux back into the esophagus which leads to the drop in the pressure uh, sorry in the pH of the lower esophagus which means that those relaxations lead to what we call reflux in this slide we are trying to visualize why children are at increased risk of reflux compared to the adult population. You can appreciate that the type of diet those kids are taking is mainly fluid, which is physically easier to flow back into, from the stomach into the esophagus. At the same time, the esophagus in children is much shorter in comparison to the adult and the capacity of the stomach is smaller and from the positioning point of view those young infants are most of the time in the lying supine position which increases the chance of flowing back from the stomach to the esophagus compared to the adult position of sitting or standing 
which decrease the chance of reflux. The adjacency of the airway to the GI make them at increased risk of complications related to the gastroesophageal reflux. As you can see, there is multiple protective mechanisms to protect our airways from the reflux content. So, this will depend on the volume of the refluxate. So, if a small volume of refluxate reaching the esophagus, which leads to esophageal distension, the upper esophageal sphincter will contract and then secondary peristalsis will lead to those content getting downward into the stomach. If the reflux material is large, esophageal distension will happen, but this will lead to activation of the vagal reflexes, which lead to vocal cord closure to prevent reaching the bronchi, central apnea, which prevent taking breath, so you will not inhale the content into the um, bronchi, the trachea, and then the bronchi in, in, and into the lungs, of course, and the upper sphincter sphincter will relax, because if it will close, this will lead to rupture of the esophagus. And this will happen within 0.15 seconds. After that, the refluxate will enter the pharynx because the roadway is opened toward the uh, pharynx. Then either those content will be swallowed again and clearing the pharynx or being spitted out. And after that, the respiration will resume. What are the mechanisms of gastroesophageal reflux? The main issue putting patients at risk of reflux is the transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. On the other hand, increased intra-abdominal pressure, like having chronica for, for example, patients with uh, uncontrolled asthma or patients with cystic fibrosis, Patients with get impaired gastric compliance or delayed gastric intake, like patients with neurological disorders. How the esophagus will be injured, it's either due to the impaired esophageal clearance, the defective tissue resistance by changing the type of mucosa in the esophagus, or the noxious composition of refluxate, whether this is an acidic material or even if it is alkali when bile is refluxed into the esophagus. And we talked before about the mechanisms of airway complications. It's either due to failure of the protective mechanisms from um, the reflux, which lead to recurrent aspiration, impaired airway protection, and then the patient will aspirate, or due to exaggerated physiological reflex by prolongation of apnea when the vagal reflexes are prolonged. Most of the time, history and physical examination are your friends to diagnose patients with gastroesophageal esophageal reflux disease. You need to remember that the presentations of children with reflux disease depend on the age. So, for example, adolescent patients may present with heartburn and with gastric pain, while younger, younger infants might present with persistent vomiting or even failure to thrive and recurrent aspiration. Using other modalities for investigation should be considered according to the presentation. And in the following slides, 
will represent the pros and cons of using different modalities in the diagnosis of patients with pediatric reflux disease. First of all, upper GI radiograph. Barium swallow gives us an idea about the anatomy of the esophagus and the stomach. But unfortunately, it will not show you the difference between or discriminate between physiological and non physiological reflux episodes. As you know, still we have reflux episodes which are physiological and will not contribute to the patient complaint and the upper GI radiography will not differentiate between those episodes and a real reflux episode. But still, you can use the GI radiography to confirm other differential diagnoses for patients presenting with persistent vomiting else than reflux or reflux disease. For example, pyloric stenosis, which will be shown very nicely in the barium swallow or the even barium meal. We usually, those are patients in the young infants between 6 to 18 weeks of age who are presented with persistent vomiting and feeling so hungry after those episodes of vomiting. On the other hand, malrotation can present with recurrent episodes of persistent vomiting relieved and going back, which might be one of the major differentials in young children with reflux. And it is very important to diagnose the patients because this is a serious surgical issue and need surgical intervention. What about SGLP H monitoring? This is a very simple principle. If you remember the slide we were talking about the lower esophageal sphincter relaxation and the change in the pH in the first few slides. So the idea of pH monitoring is you put or you place a pH probe in the lower part of the esophagus and you keep monitoring the pH at that side for 24 hours. This is a surrogate marker for reflux disease because the drop in the pH is related to the gastric content. The gastric content will reach the lower esophagus through reflux. So you can document the reflux episodes between two brackets, the lower pH episodes during your monitoring. So the advantage of such intervention or such uh, investigation that you can detect the episodes of reflux, you can associate the symptoms of the patient with the reflux episodes. For example, if the patient is having uh, chest pain, still the, the uh, device, the recording device would have a button for actuation that the patient can press on it and this would leave a mark over the recording so you can see when the patient is having those symptoms if there was a drop in the pH in the lower esophagus so you can correlate temporally between the reflux episode and the symptoms of the patient. It can also assist the adequacy of the acid substance that we are using in the patient. So if you are giving the patient the medication and still the patient is having symptoms, and you can do the pH monitoring to be sure that this patient acidity is suppressed totally or not. If still the patient is having uh, burst episodes of lower pH in the lower esophagus, this means that you are not giving enough medication or at least there is room to increase the medication or maybe you need to think of another diagnosis, for example, hypergastronemia. This will lead to 
uh, high production of acidity that you are not suppressing by giving your uh, PPIs. But still, there is limitation to this um, investigation that you cannot detect non-acidic reflux if the patient is having some medication or if the patient is having various type of uh, reflux that is causing some symptoms, you will not detect it. You cannot detect the complications associated with normal range of gastrocephalic reflux. It is not useful in detecting association between gastrocephalic reflux and apnea unless combined with other techniques, for example, lipismography, because you don't know if the patient is going into amnic episodes. You will not have those things monitored by this symbol device. So if you are thinking that the apnea episodes the patient is having is related to reflux, you need to provide this patient with other tools to detect when the patient is having the episodes of apnea and try to correlate with the timing of dropping in the acidity of the stomach of those patients. How could you judge that this measurement or this pH monitoring is suggestive of reflux? We have a couple of um, factors to calculate. The one, the first one is the number of daily reflux episodes so we can see how many reflux episodes this patient is having. The other thing is um, the persistent or the prolonged reflux episodes, those which stayed for uh, low pH below uh, 4.4 for more than 5 minutes, and the reflux index, which is the percentage of time the pH was below 4 during the 24 hours. And this is the, the main um, uh, factor used in reading the pH monitoring. And in adults, more than 4 to 6 percent uh, considered as reflux. What about upper endoscopy? Doing esophageal gastro dodenoscopy in adults is a very crucial tool for uh, investigating, investigating patients with reflux. Still, the advantage that it will enable you to visualize and take a biopsy from the esophageal epithelium, you can determine if the patient is having esophagitis or even worse complications like Barrett esophagus. It can discriminate between reflux and non-reflux esophagitis by taking biopsies or even by visualization. So, uh, as an effect esophagitis or infectious esophagitis can give you uh, pain in the upper GI tracts and even dysphagia or linophagia. But still, there is limitations for this investigation that this is an invasive procedure especially in children, you need to sedate or even anesthetize those patients. The grading system of esophagitis of the adults are not well validated for the pediatric age group. Still, there is poor correlation between the endoscopic appearance and the histopathology, and generally it's not useful for extraesophageal GERD, because if you are your patient is presenting with failed to thrive, for example, or respiratory uh, complications of the reflux disease, there is poor correlation with what's happening in the lower esophagus or in the esophagus to start with. So you can see how you investigate the reflux complications. So this bioinsola can show you the structure you can appreciate the the structure here. On the other hand, the upper endoscopy can show you there is very tiny lumen in the esophagus secondary to um, uh, structure formation or peptic uh, structure. The change the in the uh, third slide you can see 
the barrett esophagus you can appreciate the difference between the normal esophageal mucosa and the abnormal esophageal mucosa and even at the histopathological side you can appreciate the difference between the squamous epithelium normal squamous epithelium compared to the um, columnar epithelium which metabolized from the long-standing reflex. What about scintigraphy? Scintigraphy, or what's known um, as milk scan, is simply when you use a radionuclide material added to the milk or what the baby is drinking, and then you took uh, multiple images for the uh, swallowing act and after that the uh, the gastric emptying of those patients. It can detect acidic and non-acidic reflux. It can evaluate the gastric emptying and may demonstrate aspiration. So when you are taking your picture, if you can see the nuclear material shining in the trachea or in the lungs, that means definitely that those radio material is coming from the stomach. They are refluxed into the airway. So if the patient is presenting with recurrent aspiration that you are thinking, this is related to recurrent episodes of reflux disease. This is a very good type of investigation that you can use. Unfortunately, there is no standardization for the technique and the Normative data, especially we're talking here about the gastric emptying for children is not that well developed and you need a prolonged time of observation to finish the, the study. Sometimes you need almost two hours of observation to finish the uh, this study. What about multiple interluminal electrical impedance measurement or what's called impedance test? The impedance test is a very simple idea. It is coupling of the pH monitoring with measurement of electrical impedance into the esophagus. So the same electrode that we are inserting in the esophagus, which is like a nasogastric tube, will have in addition to the pH monitor probe at the lower part of the esophagus, it has multiple electrodes measuring the impedance of the electrical current in the esophagus. So simply, those electrodes will measure the change in the resistance, electrical resistance. So, as you can see from the uh, graph on the left-hand side of the slide, if the electrical current is moving from Z4, which is the lower one, into the Z1, that means that the change in the resistance is coming from down upward, which means that the stomach content or reflux content are moving from the lower esophagus into the upper esophagus. So you can document that this patient is having reflux. Why? If you can see that the change in the electrical current or the impedance and the electrodes coming from Z1 to Z4, coming from upward downward, that means that this patient is swallowing, which is this is the normal phenomenon. The patient is swallowing. So this type of investigation it can detect non-acidic reflux episode, it can detect brief acidic reflux episodes and it's useful for studying respiratory symptoms and GER in infants. But still, normal values in pediatric age groups not well defined and the analysis of the tracing is time consuming and the, the device is somehow pricey to get the patient home with, with such a, a device.
this is interesting. So you can see that this is the uh, device which is the size of the eraser of uh, pencil. And this is called Bravo Capsule. And this is a portable wireless type of pH monitor. For having just during the endoscopy, you go and um, stick it to the lower wall of the esophagus without having wires to the outside or the NV tube, and it will record the pH monitor, uh, the record the pH or monitor the pH in the lower esophagus, and it will transmit those readings um, to a device uh, hooked outside the patient, and then will analyze it as a regular pH monitor. But the idea that this is uh, more convenient, especially for the uh, older uh, persons, so you can go to uh, school, you can go to your work without having any wires or anything uh, hooking out of your nose. So this is the Bravo cap. You need to remember that vomiting in infant and children is a very common presentation. And not all children who are vomiting are refluxing ones. This is just um, a list of the differential diagnosis for a patient who is vomiting. So this will range from obstructive processes like what we showed in the uh, previous slides like bilateral stenosis or marotation, infections, whether this is um, CNS infections or even UTI in younger children, um, GI disorders like gastroparesis uh, or uh, early gastroenteritis, uh, metabolic or endocrine like the urea cycle defects or galactosemia. Sometimes this is related to neurological problems like the hydrocephalus or having subdural hematomas, obstructive uropathies, and even cardiac causes of vomiting should be thought of, such as congestive heart failure. Again, when you are taking history from those patients, you need to ask about the feeding history, the amount, the type, how the patient is washing during the uh, uh, feeding, about the burping, if there is uh, psychosocial uh, history, some stresses might induce the vomiting in younger kids, the pattern of vomiting, for example, frequency and amount, uh, forceful or not, if this is painful or not, the content of the vomitus, uh, family history of if there is a significant illness, other GI problems, um, history of metabolic allergy conditions, the uh, past medical history, including the prematurity, the growth and development of those kids. Uh, you need to look up very importantly in the growth chart of those patients, that, like the length and weight, their head circumference might suggest that there is, for example, CNS problem as a cause of this vomiting or a complicated type of reflux disease when the length or height is below the expected uh, Vomiting is a very common presentation in children and GE reflux is a psychological phenomenon but there is warning signals suggested that this is not the simple histological GR that you are dealing with for example Bilious or forceful vomiting, which might suggest that this patient is having obstruction. Hematemesis or hematkesia, there is bleeding. Abdominal tenderness or distension. Onset of vomiting after six months of life. That usually uh, patients with GER or the histologic reflux, you see this in the early on, before the age of six months, having fever, lethargy, or splenomegaly, which might point into a metabolic liver disease. 
macrocephaly, microcephaly, or seizures, which suggests that this patient might have a CNS cause or wear problem. What about the signs of complicated GERD? So if the patient is having forward gain, excessive fine or irritability, this might lead to feeding problems. So if the patient is having severe esophagitis, those babies would refuse to feed because each time they are feeding, this will increase the uh, stomach acidity with the reflux. This will further injure the already inflamed area and this would cause them to refuse to eat. Respiratory problems, as we said, recurrent wheezing, strider, or even recurrent pneumonias. All are suggestive for complicated GR. In young infants with reflux, what you can do conservatively, you can normalize the feeding volume and frequency. So, while taking the dietary history or nutritional history of the baby, you can find that the baby is taking larger volumes than what he needs. So most of the time, both the feeds he will regurge or um, spitting out part of the formula. So reducing the volumes, spacing the time between each feed might do the job. You need to consider thickening the formula. Use anti-regurgitation formula is more of physical intervention or physics intervention that more thickened formula is less likely to regurge or to reflux from the stomach. Numb bone position during sleep. Putting babies into bone position decreases the reflux, but you know this will increase the chance of uh, sudden infant death syndrome. So it is not recommended or even it's contraindication to feed babies during sleep in bone position. But during you can consider this if the parents are around and the patient is awake. Consider trial of hypoallergenic formula. One of the causes for the resistant reflux symptoms is chemical protein allergy. And usage of hypoallergenic formula might reduce the symptoms. And you need to consider chemical protein allergy as a cause for the vomiting in the kids if they are still vomiting after using the, the uh, uh, previously mentioned measures, or if there is multi system involvement, if the patient is having respiratory symptoms or skin manifestation in addition to the regurgitation or um, reflux symptoms. For older children, you need to advise the children to avoid large meals, don't lie down immediately after eating. If they are obese, you, can, um, you need to advise them to lose weight, to avoid um, foods and beverages that are known to relax the lower esophageal sphincter, like the caffeine or the chocolate, spicy food that may provoke their symptoms, and to eliminate exposure to tobacco smoke. So even passive smokers, they have increased risk of reflux symptoms secondary to the nicotine content. So young infants with recurrent vomiting, after taking a good history during your physical exam, you can uh, educate the parents regarding the warning signals that we were talking about and to reassure them if the baby is growing well, the vomiting is containing just the milk content, the non bilious there is no blood, no significant diarrhea, the development of the baby is fine. So just taking the formula, using the hypoallergenic formula, it is not recommended to give any pharmacotherapy if the baby is not having a simple reflux. If those symptoms are not resolved by uh, 18 to 24 months, you might need to consider a series throughout maritation, 
or to consider pediatric GI referral for you. This is just to show you how the kin formula would look like in comparison with the kin formula. So you need to advise the family that they need to enlarge the bottom level uh, for the uh, uh, second formula. This cartoon shows you how from positioning is improving reflex. So by the angle, the angling of the stomach with the esophagus, this will lead to, to that most of the content of the stomach will not reach the the fundus of the stomach, and this would reduce the amount of reflux aid. In comparison to the bar, uh, the supine position will put the major content of the stomach content in contact with the with the esophagus and increasing the chance of uh, refluxing, while elevation the back or having the baby in the sitting position will decrease that amount. And we are talking here about elevation of the back, the whole back, not just elevating the head, which will increase the intra-abdominal pressure and putting more pressure over the, over the stomach, and this will increase the chance of things to reflux from the stomach. Sandy Fire syndrome, this is one of the extreme presentations of reflux disease in children. And this was thought that this is um, a movement disorder to start with. And this is one of the earliest pictures for Sandy Fire syndrome that you can see that this, this patient is putting herself in bizarre positioning. The idea of it is to stretch the esophagus to close the lower esophageal sphincter as tight as possible to de decrease the reflux. And those patients, they will improve dramatically with the treatment of their reflux. What about the respiratory symptoms of GR? We are talking about apnea, uh, striders and hoarseness of voice, recurrent coughing, wheezing, recurrent spectronia. Considering the pharmacotherapy, antacids, H2 blockers, proton pump inhibitors, prokinetic agents, and surface agents are the, the five major families of medication used in patients with reflux disease. The goal of your pharmacotherapy is to control symptoms, especially if, if you are talking about, um, for example, heartburn or the gastric pain. So you can, the acid substance will decrease those symptoms. Promote healing, we are talking about, uh, for example, esophagitis, where the uh, PPIs will uh, enhance the healing of the uh, esophageal erosions or uh, ulcers, prevent complications. Um, for example, the uh, usage of some of the prokinetic, uh, for example, increasing the gastric uh, uh, emptying, reducing the chance of aspiration, improving the health related quality of life especially in patients with uh, repetitive vomiting, repetitive vomiting. If you can reduce those uh, vomiting episodes, this will improve the quality of life for both for the baby and the mother. Avoid adverse effects of treatment. This is a very major goal. You don't need to treat some single um, common manifestations with uh, medications that have serious side effects. This is just to show you where the uh, active sites were, the H2 blockers like the uh, antihistamines work in comparison to the PPI. And you need to remember that the PPI are much more effective in reducing the stomach acidity in comparison to the PPI. Brokinetics are used, although no strong evidence on the effectiveness in treating reflux disease. Only effect is to increase the gas and canteen, hoping that this will reduce the reflux episodes. Cispride is withdrawn due to the cardiac side effects. Erythromycin, on the other hand, 
have a major issue which is the tech epilepsies and you need to give the patient holidays of the medication to resume the uh, receptor levels. Dombridol is available in Jordan and we use it um, regularly in those patients. Metiplomide uh, has a, a problem with, which is the high incidence of adverse CNS effects. What about surgery for treating reflux disease in childhood? Those children who fill the medical therapy or those dependent on aggressive or prolonged medical therapy and patients with resistant asthma or recurrent pneumonia secondary to reflux disease the principles of anti-reflux surgery is to restore the intra-abdominal segment of the esophagus approximating the diaphragmatic crury reducing the hiatal hernia when present and wrap the fundus around the lower esophageal sphincter to reinforce the anti-reflux barrier in summary GR is common in healthy infants and usually resolves by 18 months of age. Pediatric reflux, reflux can present with variable symptoms. Approach to diagnosis and treatment depends on presenting symptoms and signs. Currently available tests often don't conclusively demonstrate a relationship between reflux and specific symptoms. Good history and clinical judgment are important for optimal evaluation